Blockchain Show is a podcast that demystifies cryptocurrencies and distributed ledger technology. Hello, welcome back to the Blockchain Show. This is episode 221. Today's guest is Stephen Walbrawl, the co-founder and chief security officer at Halborn. We'll be talking about key vulnerabilities in regards to blockchain and crypto, as well as his authorship for SANS, one of the top cybersecurity education organizations. Steven, welcome to the Blockchain Show. How are you doing? Thank you very much. Yes, uh, Halborn uh, is a uh, cybersecurity company for uh, cryptocurrencies uh, and uh, web applications and everything else. So we can cover everything pretty much. Yeah, that's really awesome, man. Definitely want to dig into that. Something that, that we've been doing a lot lately is we've just been asking about people's backgrounds and, and how they kind of got into blockchain, you know, if you want to tell us when you first heard about it and then maybe when you decided it'd be a good, uh, you know, good area to pursue. Or- Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, I've been in the cybersecurity space for over 20 years, uh, you know, straight out of college. I had a you know master's in computer engineering and got uh, my first uh, security job for a while working in different industries like utilities and then marketing and then I went to hospitality then finance so security for a very long time but uh, I've gotten to the offensive security side of it uh, kind of later you know I mean the last like five years of uh, you know my, the recent career and when that happened I got very uh, into like Bitcoin and like the dark net back in the earlier phases of uh, the cryptocurrency world and was got quite fascinated with how blockchain operates, where it's um, you know very different than traditional security, um, different concepts. There's like you can't really hack it in the same way you would like a website, and um, so that fascinated me because it was like interesting and and, and kind of flipped the model on its head. Um, so at the time, my previous job I was at IBM, did my first uh, like kind of smart contract audits, and uh, while that was happening around 2016, 2015 is when Ethereum started going up really high and uh, got a lot of attention on the smart contract investment side. I joined a, a Slack channel with, um, you know, about like new tokens that were coming out. And my partner from Halborn was running it uh, with his marketing agency. And his marketing agency, which is called Token Agency, was like more about investments and, you know, which ones are the new projects. And then until one day on that Slack channel, he was like, Hey, does anybody know how to do uh, some smart contract uh, security auditing or blockchain auditing? And I was like, I, I do. You know, I kind of did this uh, as a, one of the projects at my job at IBM. So um, ended up you know, working on that one audit for one of some of his clients. And then you know, it happened again and happened again. And like security was just, you know, there was like rampant hacks going on all the time. And uh, it just became a business. And uh, about three years later, here we are with... Um, you know, it's it's my full time gig, actually double full time because I probably work eighty hours a week, uh, hacking smart contracts with uh, a team of eighty people now. Right, uh, just you know, focus on all these projects like Terra, all the Ethereum contracts, Solana, and and even uh, exchanges like Coinbase and BlockFi, and, and on and on. You know, we have hundreds of clients right now. That's awesome. Yeah, congratulations. It sounds like I don't know. Is this stretch to say like a dream gig, or is this something you imagined yourself doing? You know, it's it's kind of funny because I've always been the type like I hate management and I hated like extra meetings and I just wanted to like leave me alone and let me hack. And uh, now that you know Halborn's become kind of you know the company where it's it's something that I created. I care so much about like all the people that work here and like managing them and making sure they're happy. And really here at the company, we we make sure that you know taking all of the things I saw that I was you know thought was inefficient from maybe like larger companies and, you know, building it so that yeah, we actually at Halborn, Bitcoin has this concept of proof of work and it's a, uh, you know, the more hash power you put into it, the more rewards you get. We have the same concept at Halborn where it's kind of a meritocracy and it's proof of work. So uh, the, you know, the more you, uh, you put into it as like a pen tester or you know, whatever you're involved in at the company, uh, you get rewarded more internal bug bounties and you know, we love tons of like gamification programs so our our slogan here is kind of proof of work, and you know it's uh, if you uh, you pr- prove the value, if you you're finding tons of vulnerabilities, making tools, making more efficiencies, then uh, yeah, you earn more, more rewards and recognition. I like that. Yeah, the more yeah the more skills. Like if you have a higher like critical findings, like we have uh, you know, one guy that's uh, 
couple of months ago, he took down an entire blockchain network. I'm not going to throw any any chains under the rug, but uh, that was obviously he did uh, quite a good job on finding a vulnerability. <laughs> so his work was proven, and um, yeah, we they we get more points. Uh, every quarter we have like a kind of like internal bug bounty, but it's not just for finding vulnerabilities. It's also for you know if you do a you know a talk at DEF CON or if you write a, a really great blog you write a utility or script that saves tons of times like all that stuff kind of counts for the, the points here so it's all yeah rewarding all that work that you know you put in and uh it's you know, transparent you know everybody kind of sees it no no favoritism here and i really like that because you get um you know sometimes you get lost in the, you know doing their same routine every day and you know, even myself, I was like, I could do so much more than what, you know, my job functions are now. Like, I, how can I, how can I contribute more? And you really can't because you get stuck in that, like, you know, that silo. So we, we, I try to break those silos here and it's, I mean, this is why we've kind of like exploded recently on our, uh, on our, our growth, you know, internally and, and externally with um, our quality of work that we've done. Yeah. That's great, man. I love to hear that. Yeah. You bring up a good point about the um, vulnerabilities and, it's it's cool to think about this team of people hacking a uh, you know a network or system to make it better because you know that there's people out there who are hacking it for nefarious reasons. So I wanted to ask you what you know some of those key vulnerabilities might be because you know I think you said earlier we think of blockchain as being the super secure technology, but it's been proven in the past that it's not always the case. Right? Yeah. This it's very interesting you know, what's at stake as security practitioners or you know, auditors for blockchains, and especially smart contracts, because when you think of the uh, the technology, you have blockchain being the underlying like con- you know, consensus behind it of, you know, whether it's proof of work or proof of stake, but consensus is almost like the foundation network layer, uh, the way they communicate in a you know, decentralized uh, network. And then the smart contracts is the the functionality, like the, the application layer in a way, you know, the, that lives on the blockchain. And a lot of the vulnerabilities, you know, that we've seen that you hear on the news, like poly network hack, that was, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. And the ones that happened for, you know, with a significant financial impact, those are usually on smart contracts and the vulnerabilities there, you know, if you compare it to a traditional security test, you know, if you're a black hat, you know, and you're trying to find a vulnerability and exploit it, if you were doing like a PCI, you know, network or like some type of financial, you know, system that's getting their crown jewels, whether it's like health data for HIPAA or, you know, credit card information, you know, usually it's like phishing somebody, get a foothold in the network, move laterally into the DMZ, you know, find and locate that. Hopefully you haven't gotten caught yet and extract them, sell it on the dark market, dark net market. And then finally, you know, you can make, you know, $5 per card or whatever it is. Most of the impact is actually on the regulation and the, compliance and reputational hit the company takes. But as a black hat, you don't really, you know, earn as much, you know, as I guess, you know, from that data. On blockchain, this stuff, like one vulnerability on a smart contract can lead to almost instantaneous exploitation that's done anonymously for millions of dollars. So black hats are starting to see that this is uh, an opportunity um, that it can have a lot less risk and a lot more rewards so, you know, it's it, it's it's occurring now, um, and it's critical because these vulnerabilities that you find on the blockchain, uh, they're immutable. You know, blockchain can't be uh, you know updated or patched in a way. You know, there are things like proxy patterns and stuff, but essentially, it's yeah, it can be done by anybody on public ledger at any time for large amounts of of, of, of value. So it's uh, pretty crucial to um, you know do security auditing, and that's where we come in and. You know, our our work is uh, is a extremely valuable to the people that are writing these that, that this code. Yeah, absolutely. The ones that I am aware of, obviously, made the news are usually related to exchanges, but that's more of a that's that's a risky bet, anyways. Especially back then, um, thinking of like Mt. Gox and and some of those other kind of kind of famous yeah. things. But and, that's, and- it's not. Sorry, right. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, no. I'm agreeing with you. It's like the exchanges. That's uh, those hacks. It's still that's like centralized uh, security. Still, in a way, it's like yeah, the website holding the keys, and that's the thing about blockchain: the, the private keys and 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 like the the way it works is if you have the access to that key, 
you know, it, you become the bank, like you're responsible, it's self-sovereignty and uh, that you're giving up uh, kind of the letting the exchange have the accountability of security to you have to be responsible for the security. So that's where it comes in is like you gave up that responsibility, which is really not like uh, kind of the self-sovereignty aspect of, of Bitcoin, for example, <laughs> in a way. Yeah. And that's powerful. But also, uh, like you said, you become the bank. That's, that's a big responsibility. But when, um, when we're talking about some of these vulnerabilities and how hackers are able to steal crypto, how theoretically could that happen with private keys? Would it just be like user error or uh, negligence or is there more sophisticated means to to do that? Yeah. So, uh, so the whole part of the are the private keys going to be like brute force with quantum computing or anything? I don't, I have to say like, no, the math, the, the amount of keys that uh, you, you could create from a public key, let's say to reverse it, every atom in the universe could have its own private key. And um, I think the number of qubits for a quantum computer to crack that is just astronomical. Like we're nowhere near. And if we ever do get near it, we'll just like update the, you know, the, the entropy of that encryption. So that's not, that's not a worry that we have, we ever concern ourselves with. It comes down to, <laughs> this is where the similarities are with virtual security user error, like phishing and giving up the keys or accidentally exposing it. Um, having somebody, you know, trick you into showing them the key, or uh, there's a mnemonic seed phrase. That's pretty much your, what generates your key. If that, if you're irresponsible with that and you know, leave it on a sticky note or copy paste it and somebody gets that, then you know that'll that'll compromise your your uh, your funds. And um, that's just like any other like password, except it's uh, irrecoverable. So that needs to be considered uh, in extreme case. Protection of that key is is a, a paramount. Uh, you know, the number one thing that you should be looking at for security. Yeah, that that freaks me out about the copy paste thing because I've definitely done that before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's um some uh, some different attacks to like if you you know leave the key you know in memory somewhere you know uh, you could have it happen to exploit it that way. Environment variables because if you're doing a you know in on GitHub code if you have an environment variable or if you have like just the mnemonic phrase or the the private key there to use to deploy a smart contract interact with it. I mean somebody can find it there. So it's a uh, reconnaissance and locating the information can, it can do that kind of stuff too. Yeah. That's really interesting. So other than private keys, what are some other vulnerabilities that, that uh, might be exploited? Yes. Yeah, so the, the code vulnerabilities uh, in um, let's say smart contracts, cause this is where the, the significant ones are for, you know, the financial uh, impacts, the code vulnerabilities there are, very different. And you know, we discover new zero day type of attacks all the time. Uh, you don't have your like SQL injections or OWASP top 10 uh, typically because you know there is no C database really. You have other things like re-entrancy attacks or uh, you'll have you know integer overflows or some, but a lot of the times now the, the attacks that, that are uh, the most uh, impactful are financial attacks. Uh, like if you've heard of DeFi, it's like decentralized finance. So it's using the environment of these contracts on chain to um, pretty much like either arbitrage or utilize those funds. Like a, there's something called a flash loan attack. A uh, flash loan is you can borrow a certain amount of uh, like Ethereum or tokens and use that to create price instability. And when that price instability happens, you could, you know, swap tokens for like pennies on the dollar and then send your loan back there and you just like made off like, uh, like a bandit. Um, that kind of stuff is like financial pen testing and understanding like the logic of the way these things work. If you understand how, how these like DeFi Lego blocks all fit together and you can cause a you know, financial type of attacks against these things here. So that's the, that's what we see a lot of like on uh, for the more recent and more relevant um, attacks that's more about the logic of the code rather than, you know, statically finding flaws in the code, which which happens, you know, sometimes, but um, they're not as complicated and they're not as, uh, I guess, uh, impactful uh, now as they used to be. Yeah. Wow, man. How do you, uh, how do you come up with this? 
I mean, I, I don't mean that in a disparaging way because I mean it's it's brilliant. But well, I mean, I'm not taking credit for coming up with it myself. Here, we have a team of 80 brilliant like engineers and um, that are constantly. I mean, like right next to me, I have like a book, you know, how to DeFi, and it's uh, just understanding the way this stuff works. It's creativity, really. You know, the mindset of an attacker or uh, you know any any black hat is you focus on how do I break it? You know, not there's like building and breaking and to really understand, you know, something sometimes like to know how to break it is, is how you can learn, you know, the, <laughs> learn it better. So, you know, we always say, okay, what, you know, starting at the end, like what, what is the goal? You know, where are, do I want to, you know, compromise this to steal funds? Do I want to break it to, you know, shut it down, denial of service protect? And then work your way backwards from there, like in creative ways to think how you can utilize, you know, functions for what they're not intended to do or find, you know, access control type of things that you can override or get control of. You know, the attack patterns are the same, but so, so penetration testing uh, is like an artwork. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a creative engagement more than it is a structured, like follow the script. And really, that's how, how we come up with these uh, you know, findings or locate these vulnerabilities is using creativity and understanding the way it operates and then you know, reverse engineering it, finding creative ways to utilize you know, access or ownership or the logic to you know, make it work unintended than what the developers um, you know, had coded it for. So it really just comes with a, a clear understanding of the way it operates and knowing the logic and then, you know, playing around with it, like hacking a video game almost. It's like, you know, I unlock this like magical sword. How did I unlock this? And it's like, oh, there's a code flaw here that I can take advantage of. And it's, that's really what we do is like, you know, kind of approaching it from an aspect of like, how do I operate this? Great. Now I know how to use it. Now, how can I use it for against its purpose it was for? Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. I, I like that. Yeah, and then the whole phishing stuff is, uh, you know, attacking. That's like attacking the code flaws. And back to what you're saying about like the private keys, you know, a lot of that is attacking the user. There's tons of social engineering type of attacks, especially for these like speculative tokens and investing or staking, where you know people, you know, they want to get involved like early. You know, as as you know, they call it like alpha. They get in early and they take advantage of that. Uh, I guess that eager or excitement or, you know, people that don't really do their research and don't know what they're doing and tricking them to put their money inside of like funds on the smart contracts or on the blockchain. And, uh, you know, they're, they're fake ones or clones and they get, you know, their, their, their stuff stolen or rug pulled is the, you know, the terminology for it. Yeah. Those are the worst, man. Cause I mean, psychologically it just messes with you. You know, if anyone's ever been a victim of those, cause I, I just don't like the social engineering stuff, man. Yeah, it's it's sad too. <laughs> you can see it happen in real time. You know, like we we're, you know, we're here as defenders for this to, you know, like one of the scenarios we see is people just like copy like a, a chat room of all the users there and make a another chat room and invite all those users and say, welcome to like you know the secret private release version that you're early here and they'll they say, hey, go ahead and send all your money to this you know address. Uh, or you go ahead and you fund this liquidity pool and everybody's like, yes, oh, I'm selected for some early release. And they put their money there and it's big, you know, just social engineering scam and, you know, they get their stuff stolen. Yeah, that's terrible. Some people are just not very nice. Ruthless. Yes, that's a better way to put it. <laughs> and it's all transparent too. You can go and like on the, you know, what's, what's interesting about blockchain is it's a, a public ledger and you can see the transactions happening like in real time and seeing where they go. I mean, that's one good part about it is like the forensics, you could see where the funds go. And sometimes, you know, you can kind of track, it's harder to like get the funds off the chain, you know, without going through some, uh, I guess like coin joins or through some, you know, what's called tornado cash, but we, we talk about that later on, but yeah, it's hard because you could like see where the, where the money is going and <laughs> try to catch them on the way out. Well, I, I can tell there's a, there's a lot of thoughtfulness that goes into this and probably an incredible amount of work, you know, engineering wise, you know, and this is a really fascinating topic. We could probably spend the whole podcast just talking about this, but it's up to you if you wouldn't mind 
telling us, how, you know, just how you are addressing some of these vulnerabilities, or or maybe just yeah, maybe we should just dir- direct people towards towards your company. You know, no, <laughs> that might be easier. Yes, no, actually, it's it, it, another really cool thing about uh, this industry, and what I like it, uh, I like it too, is because not only is the attacks come sometimes transparent, but the identifying the vulnerabilities is transparent, and we have um, a, a GitHub of our like penetration test reports or the, what we found that are, is public for people to see uh, which is kind of weird. If you're uh, coming from like the traditional security background, usually pen test reports are like confidential information, you know, hit, hit top secret. They never released. And in this, you know, in this community there, it's like marketing material. Sometimes it's like, we just got our pen test report done. Here's the vulnerabilities they found and we fix them. And they're released as uh, you know, bringing instilling confidence in you know investors or the people that that they did their due diligence and for the audits. So that's sometimes uh, you know directing. If you anybody here would like to see that, um, we have GitHub.com/slash Halborn Security. There's hundreds of public penetration test reports and that can uh, you know can skim through and see the types of vulnerabilities, how they are found, how they are fixed, and it's a uh, really good research material there. Um, to see the you know the way we address it to kind of like talk through the workflow of that is when we uh, work with a client, you know we find out what where the target assets are, look at the smart contracts or the blockchain code, and um, you know we'll do it on ourselves, identify the vulnerabilities, and it's kind of like a constructive two way communication of you know find it, fix it, retest until it's at a state that we both feel comfortable with for risk level, and then it's uh, kind of publicized and you know, pushed to the network or pushed to the blockchain network for people to start using. Um, so that, that whole process is usually uh, private until, you know, the release and then you know, it becomes public. That's really cool. Would, would you say that uh, education is something that uh, you enjoy kind of? Oh, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. I love, you know, uh, even though, uh, you know, at SANS and, um, you know, being a, a, an author of the SANS course for blockchain, you know, SEC 554 is blockchain smart contract security is, and I, you know, it's, I teach this, I'm still like a student for life. <laughs> I I think myself and everybody that I, I work with at Halborn, we're more security researchers than, you know, like engineers, because we're always the hunger to learn. And that's, that's what we hire for too, is people that just want to learn stuff and, and find new things and uh, innovate and, uh, you know, kind of push the boundaries of what's been done before and, um, you know, the, the willingness to learn. So education is hundred percent part of that. Even internal, we, you know, we support education. We encourage our, our, um, you know, employees and engineers to write training materials, write documentation on how they did it, go and do independent research on new things. And it kind of have that feedback loop of giving that back to the community so that these vulnerabilities are then understood and prevented for the future um, and educating and security awareness for that. So security awareness is something that we do too for customers and, and internally. So yeah, it's all about knowledge and, and awareness. I'm glad to hear you say that because that's a really good quality of a teacher just continuing to learn. So I wanted to ask a little bit more about SANS, uh, maybe maybe break it down for us, um, and, you know, in case anyone out there is listening that, that might want to um, get into learning. Um, I know it's cybersecurity education, but is it is it specifying in anything particular or just overall cybersecurity? Yeah, so SANS, um, you know, speaking of being a, a student, uh, SANS is something, they're the best, uh, you know, I would say this, in my opinion, the best security educator because they're very hands-on. They have tons of events. Their classes are usually highly, um, highly involved where you have uh, hands-on labs and CTFs and you know, they make you really learn it, not just from like PowerPoint slides and take a test and you're done, but there's practical use for it. It's taught and authored usually by the best of each industry. And it's not just blockchain. It's everything from network security, web application security, social engineering, um, all the way to forensics, you know, uh, you know, side of things and investigations and defense. So they are focused on security, whether it's offensive, defensive compliance and SANS, um, they they didn't have a blockchain security course until uh, you know until recently. So 
I've taken almost all of the pen testing courses from SANS the past 10 years of my career, got to the point where it's like, all right, the only thing now to do is to write a course for them. <laughs> Became very close with some of the authors there too. Um, and yeah, I ended up writing the course for them on blockchain. It's a three-day course, uh, but it is actually being redeveloped um, and um, can't disclose the date yet, but with, you know, with sometime this year, we're re-releasing it as a five-day course because there's so much uh, content that um, you know th this industry moves so fast that uh, we want to make it relevant and something that you can take home. So the, the three-day course was originally around blockchain fundamentals for uh, people that are new to it blockchain um you know security attacking and defenses and this is around like the network layer of it all like bitcoin and then smart contract hacking and that's around the code you know on smart contracts so that that course is now being redeveloped um and it's going to be updated to have this financial attack that i had uh, mentioned previously about how to do this uh you know decentralized finance exploiting as well as uh rust based chain. So not just Ethereum and Bitcoin, but moving into things like Solana and Terra, Near, Cardano, like other chains that have become very large in the past couple of years. Um, and then also forensics, investigation, you know, blockchain monitoring and defense. So uh, that's going to be a more holistic class to cover all, all this, this new technology that's come out recently. Um, so that's all comes with hands-on labs and um, you know, practical ways to to try the hacking in real time. And that's how SANS does all their courses, which is why I value them. I think you know, students usually like to get involved in it that way. Yeah, definitely. I might have to check it out, even though I'm not uh, in any way capable of doing any of this work just to, uh, just to learn, you know, because I try to keep up on things, you know, obviously hosting this podcast and that, that in itself is a full-time job. And it's usually reading articles, reading books, but uh, I think I might might check out some courses for uh, people who are actually building things because that might give me a little bit of a better a better insight, yeah. you know? It's really, you know, when you take the courses, you really learn it. The, um, you know, the labs are, you know, always uh, well-written enough so you can recreate, you know, even if you're new to it, you can walk through it to you know, see it through and then, you know, they, they kind of force you to use your brain um, and, you know, help you out so that you can complete it. So it's uh, reading is one thing and, you know, kind of like listening to an instructor talk is, is one thing and it's good, but it's actually doing it with your hands on where it, 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 uh, it connects and kind of like stays with you, that stickiness of it. So they, they add that value to it. Um, yeah, I highly recommend it. I, I feel I've learned a lot from you know, from that uh, methodology here. Oh, I see. Oh, I'm, I might need to do some homework first then because so there's like actual modules where you're, you're working with code. Oh yeah. Yep. Yeah. There's ones you get an operating system and you go into the code and they get to like play around with that and then like compile it. Uh, you can download it, hack it and, uh, you know, really understand how it all operates relevant to the real world. So you know, sometimes we'll use examples of real hacks uh, and all the SANS courses will have um, kind of like real life use cases that are implemented in a controlled environment. So uh, that's where they have the labs. You know, some some classes have an entire architecture of like a network simulation of a, a corporate environment. And it's like scanning all of that. And, you know, whether it's something like Active Directory or a website, um, you know, they'll have all of that be simulated and um, you get to kind of do it the way you would in the, in, in, in the wild. As, so that's how their, their classes are. And it's uh, great to have, you know, you feel comfortable now if you like ever wanted to apply it in, you know, to the real life. And uh, it, it gives you that experience rather than theoretical knowledge. Yeah. Wow. That, that's a huge value. Because um, even just, uh, you know, my kids, they're getting, they're still young, you know, first grade and below. And they have an interest in computers and video games and they want to make games. So I got some, you know, those little like, apps where you work on code and a few of them are more advanced and I was you not know, to be honest I was playing around with them one time and I was like man this is really fun I wish I would have gotten into this when I was a kid <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know it's my I started uh, in, you know in computer engineering because I wanted to to make video games and you know I was a big gamer um in my teens and my uh my parents were like what do you want to go for school for I was like 
whatever involves video games. <laughs> so, and it was like, well, you can make video games with code. I'm like, okay. So I did computer science for that. By the time I got out of college, is like I, you know, didn't ever get into game development. It actually kind of hurt my my game development because I like, didn't have that uh, you know, what do they call it uh, immersion anymore. Instead of like enjoying the game, I was like thinking about the the code modules in the game. It's like it kind of ruined oh, yeah. that for me. <laughs> <laughs> but in but in a good way, you know, because I really, you know, you kind of like pulled back the curtain and saw how it's all done. And it's I think that video games are actually kind of like one of the most ultimate art forms in a way, because where else do you combine music and coding and actual like, you know, drawing, uh, storytelling. It's like all of that can be put together in like a, a game package. So it's like the ultimate art form. And, you know, now like going through this and, you know, security is kind of an art form in its way too, or it's like, you know, code, you know, <laughs> changing the code for it all. Um, so that's that's my. If you can't tell, I'm like a very creative, like a creative type soul. I like uh, art and and all this uh, creativity aspect and using your imagination. Um, yeah, I, I like what you said about video games. I wish that my wife could understand that because. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ever listen to this podcast? You know, yeah. Maybe she'll... <laughs> well, she does the artwork. I'll have to convince her to actually listen to one one of these times. This is your artwork, man. This is like you're like yours. Uh, it's like look what we I create here. This is <laughs> my art. Yeah. Well, I mean, I know we talked a little bit about the the vulnerabilities. You know, there's plenty more we could talk about. Yeah, want well, anything about the uh, you know the new, the latest uh, Russian sanctions and uh, Ukrainian you know issues going on there? I know that's the the relevant topic in the news everywhere. It's hard to know what's really going on over there. Obviously, it's never good when loss of life happens. But what's something I've never seen before in in a modern warfare is the extent of, of, uh, sanctions. And it's almost becoming like a politically correct thing to do for large companies to just cut, cut off sending their product to, to Russia when the citizens of that country, you know, that's, they didn't do any, it's not really their fault. Which is why like, yeah, that's where it gets into, uh, I myself and why I like blockchain and, and, you know, most cryptos is because of the, you know, the decentralization of it, where it's, you know, again, that independent, ownership and you know you can't force anything to be like shut off like this like you know cancel culture type thing of like you know just turning it off whether you're innocent or guilty you know is somebody's opinion with with blockchain it's you know permissionless like you can't you know if you look at something like bitcoin you can't just like shut bitcoin off you know it's it's a global network it doesn't matter what country you're from it doesn't care about government it doesn't care about politics and it's, you know, my favorite quote, I, I, I love like, you know, saying this in, in certain situations, but, you know, Bitcoin is the people's money, whereas like fiat or this like sanctions on SWIFT network, this is government money and gold is God's money, which is, you know, created from the earth. So, you know, this is something that like the people, uh, you know, have this currency and it's through this uh, decentralization and self-sovereignty where, you know, you can send your know, funds and still interact you know, with, through this technology, regardless of any sanction. I mean, they may outlaw it and it's not my, you know, I'm not saying that, Hey, break the law and you know, trade Bitcoin if it's illegal in your country, but technology, you know, the tech, with the technology, you know, the, the option yeah, is there. I like what you, you know, said. And this is really good illustration because right now people are, you know, it's crazy. Like crypto is really popular. Gold has gone up since the highest, since like 2020 people are, I don't know what's going on with the stock mm -hmm. market, but I hear it's not too good. So, yeah. Oh man. This is another podcast. If you want to go later on and talk about financial markets, like all day long. So it's, it's, I know all about it, which is why, which is why I like Bitcoin. You know, what's interesting about gold too, is if you look at the, uh, historically, Russia has been um, accumulating lots of physical gold uh, for for years now, and letting go of the USD, like you know, treasuries, uh, to kind of like you know, the telltale signs of, of this have been happening, where you know they've been getting all this like you know commodities there, um, expecting like a hey, you can shut us off from like the dollar, but we have you know the gold here in the country, so you know. If, now, like, you know, what's ownership of it? Like, 
the dollar or like a commodity, you know, that, that type of thing. So it's, uh, it's quite interesting with the, the all the, the federal reserve money printing and stuff that they want to call it. That too is, um, you know, can cause like the stock market equities to be at higher ratios than or valuations than they really are too. So you don't know. This is a whole nother yeah, topic. That we, we might have to have you come back on, on to, to dive into that. Cause, uh, I was getting into some debates, debates with a friend about Bitcoin and he was all upset that, uh, you know, most of it's owned by some of the wealthiest people in the world. And I was trying to tell him like, well, you don't have to buy a whole Bitcoin, you know, you can get a fraction of it. And, but I think, I think most people get a little mm-hmm. too fixated on the price to, to begin with, you know? Well, you know, for me, you know, this might sound mac- maxi, uh, but one Bitcoin is one Bitcoin. That's how much it's costing. <laughs> it's all your, what's your peg? What's your frame of reference for it? You know, if your frame of reference is the US dollar, then one Bitcoin costs, you know, like what, 39,000. But if your frame of reference is Bitcoin, then one Bitcoin is uh, equal to one. How yeah. much does one dollar cost? You know, to you. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. The more, <laughs> the more I explore the topic of money, the more it just kind of, it all comes down to this. So I'll just say it. supply and demand. It's like simple economics and value is the perception of value. So supply and demand, obviously if there's a higher supply, then the demand has to be there. Otherwise, you know, value will go down. Zeros in a computer on Bitcoin, the supply is capped for Bitcoin is 21 million and that's it. So it's actually a deflationary asset that becomes rare over time. And it's, you know, you can argue that, oh, it's just imaginary numbers, but that's really like what cash is anyways. I mean, yeah, we have paper dollars for it, but you're, what's backing it is like the faith in the, the currency uh, people that are, are, you know, producing it like the government. Um, so it's either you have faith in technology and uh, the network, or you have faith in the government, you know, backing the treasuries. So it's just what is where's your value placement, and that's you know r- what the argument is. Yeah, I, I wish we could have faith in governments, but historically, it's not always a good bet, you know. Yeah, they they come and go, you know. So, uh, yeah, so it's not an investment, uh, you know, podcast or investment, uh, you know, chat here. But it's always good to like, you know, diversify and things. And I, me personally, I like to in, invest uh, and you know, put my money in things that, you know, I enjoy to, you know, I actually bought tons of comic books <laughs> like a few years ago that I like, and they've ended up being great investments too. So. <laughs> That's really cool, man. Steven, I really enjoyed this conversation. Love to be back. You know, if, if you want to schedule another one later on. <laughs> yeah, definitely, man. Definitely. So, um, yeah, if you, you don't mind, you know, maybe leaving us with, you know, where people can go to, uh, to learn on SANS um, or, or maybe even connect with you or anything you'd like to leave us with would be great. Yeah, for sure. So uh, SANS.org is the website there. You know, they have tons of classes there. We are um, putting together, not official announcement yet, but a large um, blockchain focused event uh, in a partnership with Halborn and SANS together. Uh, so that's something that may be coming uh, later on. You can find Halborn, which is my company, at halborn.com, H-A-L-B-O-R-N.com, or very active on Twitter, uh, Halborn Security on Twitter. And you can always uh, you know, message me there. Um, I see that usually. And um, you know, SANS is uh, you know, very active on their, on their website. If you like classes, they offer on-demand classes, so you can take it on your own time. And they currently do live online, uh, you know, depending on the class, sometimes they have them, you know, once, uh, once a month, sometimes, um, you know, less often. Uh, so you can see all that schedule on sans.org. And if you have any questions about either getting into security uh, for blockchain, or you are a developer and you want, want security, or you just want to see what it's like, you know, halborn.com has all that stuff. Yeah, that's great. Well, Stephen, thank you so much for your time. It's been a real pleasure talking to you today. Okay, thank you for having me.